The last step we were talking about on the insight path is the conformity knowledge. And that conformity knowledge applies to making the connection, to making the connection between that which we have learned about the Buddha's teaching and all the insights that may have arisen and putting them into their respective places so that everything fits into anicca dukkha anatta. Conformity knowledge refers to the 37 factors of enlightenment. Now I've already spoken about most of them. The one that is still necessary to refer to the Noble Eightfold Path. Now the Noble Eightfold Path is again like a telegram style of the whole of the teaching, the whole of the direction. And it consists of the three parts, just as all the teaching does, Sila, Samadhi and Panya. Morality, concentration, and inside wisdom. These three parts are everywhere to be found and everywhere to be practiced. They usually come in this order, Sila, Samadhi and Panya. The morality has to be practiced first. If we don't have moral conduct, there is a constant feeling of insecurity and a lot of negativity in the mind and if we become aware of it there will be remorse and regret and none of that will be helpful for the practice. Concentration is our tool and our goal is inside wisdom. In the Noble Eightfold Path, the progression is not in that same order. It's not morality, concentration, inside wisdom, but it starts with inside wisdom. Then goes to moral conduct, and then goes to concentration. The Noble Eightfold Path is not to be construed that we do one thing after another. It is eight things which we have to practice. At the same time, so to say, so that our practice amounts to something. However, it starts out with the wisdom because without wisdom, we wouldn't be practicing at all. If we didn't have enough insight already into the unsatisfactoriness of the worldly condition, then we wouldn't be interested in getting out of worldly conditions. So that's one part of wisdom. And it's called right view, samaditi. Sama means right, diti means view. Interestingly enough, when sama is left off and it's just called diti, it means wrong view. It doesn't mean view, it means wrong view. All ditis are wrong views. <laughs> <laughs> so it's either right or wrong. Now right view has as its very first step the understanding that we need to do something. And it also has embedded in it that we have an idea already about cause and effect. That we no longer believe that whatever we do, it doesn't have an effect on us and others. That we have already stopped blaming conditions, blaming others, blaming circumstances, 
blaming our past experiences, we stop that already. That's the right view to get started. That we see already at that point that it's up to us. Nobody else. I've got to do it. And if not me, who then? So, and if not now, when? It comes from a different tradition, but it's just as valuable here. So that is, a, is our starting point for right view. That we realize that the worldly conditions will never be totally satisfactory and that it's entirely up to us. It doesn't matter what our past experience has been. If we think, as is so often the case, that the past experiences in our life in childhood were detrimental to our psychological development and they very well might have been. How detrimental have been all the experiences we've had in past lives for hundreds and hundreds of years? Even more detrimental. And who is there to blame? We can't even remember who it was, can we? So it's really useless. The moment is now. This is the moment. This is the only moment we've got. All other moments are either gone or have not yet come. So there's only one, and this is this, this one. And this is the one to have right view in. So having a right view now brings us onto the Noble Eightfold Path, which has the steps in a very short version of explanation which can take us all the way to freedom. Right view has also the connotation of being the end of the Noble Eightfold Path. It is the beginning, so can we can get started, but it's also the end. The end means that we have knowledge and vision of things as they really are, which is actually the next step after conformity knowledge, which is our next inside step which takes us across. Knowledge and vision of things as they really are means that we have understood but also seen within us. Just understanding is quite useful, but it doesn't have a real effect. The real effect only comes when we have the inner experience. So right view means exactly that. The knowledge and the vision the understood experience of things as they are, not as we thought they might be, not as we would like them to be, for some unknown reason we would always like them to be different from the way they really are, and not as we have made up our mind that they are, but as they really are. And to see things as they really are is, of course, not as easy as one might assume. One could assume that seeing things as they really are shouldn't be very difficult because, I mean, an intelligent person shouldn't have any problem seeing things as they really are. But apparently we have no end of problem with it. Because if we didn't have any problem with it, we'd never be unhappy. Obviously, we are having a lot of problem with that, seeing how things really are. The reason we are having problem with it, because first of all, the mind which is not totally concentrated in meditation is not incisive enough to stop all its rummaging around and all its extraneous proliferations. 
ordinary human minds are full of proliferation fantasies ideas views hopes memories and judgments constant judgments if we could give away the judgments we'd find ourselves greatly relieved the judgments that we have over and over again make things more difficult but they also bring with it wrong view because they are colored by our ego delusion or discolored by our ego delusion they cannot be true so seeing things as they really are means that we have come to the inner experience of that constant flux and flow which we have been investigating all this time how everything arises and ceases how nothing can stay and also how nothing can be satisfying not only because it can't stay but also because we have to resurrect it so we have a constant energy output to get what we want and can never be still and at peace and at ease the dissatisfaction or the unsatisfactoriness is explained in telegram style in the first and second noble truth of which the noble eightfold path is the fourth noble truth and it's explained very succinctly and very briefly in this way first noble truth is the noble truth of dukkha and the second noble truth is the noble truth of arising of dukkha or the cause of dukkha which is craving very simple get rid of craving no dukkha and craving of course does not necessarily mean that we want material things we may have got past that already but one thing that everyone who's not enlightened wants is their own mind and body those cravings which are the three the three tanhas of main cravings are a craving for sensual gratification having pleasure through the senses the craving to be and if everything goes completely haywire the craving not to be which is just the same thing it's only the other side of the same coin so that craving in itself brings constant dukkha now if we have as we have here much time to investigate this is the craving we need to investigate is that dukkha and it shows itself in all sorts of fears some people are afraid of spiders some people are afraid of the dark some people are afraid of not being loved some people are afraid of death everybody's afraid of death except when one has gone past that um some people are afraid of having um, an emotional put down not being having emotional support some people are afraid of the future of old age of sickness any number of fears any name you'd like to give it it's all included in what's called bhava tanha the craving to be that's all it is 
Now this craving to be is so deeply rooted that just by knowing about it makes very little difference. However, it needs to be investigated. And particularly if it becomes clear that a fear has arisen. To investigate it. What am I afraid of? And as I have said numbers a number of times, every answer presents a new question. Every answer is the new question. Now, fear is exactly that which shows up our craving. And very often what we do is, by naming it, putting the fear into a certain box, saying that is my fear, we try to pretend it's the only fear we've got. It isn't. We've just taken that one on and accepted that one and saying, okay, this is the one I've got, everything else is fine. I'm only not okay in this one area. But in reality, it's nothing but the craving to be, which creates dukkha under all circumstances. Not just if one sees a spider, or when somebody doesn't appreciate us, or when we think about our own death. It creates problems everywhere. Now this is the inquiry. The finding that fear in, in one's own reactions, even if one doesn't call it fear, and seeing it for what it is. If we don't know that we have craving to be, we certainly can't get rid of it. We have to know it first. The, the, the Buddha's uh, uh, teaching to get us out of dukkha centers around those four noble truths which are aware he's experience when he became enlightened under the Bodhi tree. And that's how he voiced them in those Four Noble Truths. So the first two are that. And you can check those first two out any time at all. Now. During meditation, outside of meditation. Is there any kind of disquiet within it doesn't have to be great suffering. If it's great suffering, that's fine. That's even easier to see. But <laughs> if it's just a feeling of disquiet, a feeling of not being totally at ease, totally comfortable, worrying about this or that, thinking about this or that, Letting go of whatever it is that appears to create that disquiet. Just letting go of it for one moment and becoming aware of the fact that the disquiet has disappeared for that moment. You can pick up the same craving the next moment and have the same disquiet again. You don't have to think that you now have to lose this, whatever it is you want. You can have it. You just need to see that by getting rid of it, everything is fine. Whatever we want, whatever we don't want, produces dukkha. Dukkha is a feeling of not being totally and completely at ease, peaceful, satisfied, fulfilled, harmonious, joyous, all that, not being any of that, all of that is dukkha. And those who are, can meditate and have experienced the jhanas know exactly what it means to be joyous and peaceful and so on. 
Because if we want something while we're doing the jhanas, we're certainly not going to get them. So, this is a personal proof of the first and second noble truths that you can try out any time. What is it that makes me uneasy, what has some sort of not being totally fulfilled, what's that feeling? And then dropping it, what it is, whatever it is one wants. It's very often the wanting something which has, which arises far more often, especially in a meditation course, wanting something. Now with those two, first two noble truths comes the fourth one, which is how to get to the third one. The third one is the cessation of all dukkha, which is called in Pali Nibbana, in Sanskrit Nirvana, and in English anything you like. (laughs) Freedom, liberation, security, the end of suffering, the deathless, whatever it is. It has more than 32 synonyms. Literally translated, it means non-burning. Nir is another one of the non-syllables, same as ni. Nir is the same. Ni is the same. Ni means non. And it means vana is burning, non-burning. No passions. Sometimes people say to that, oh, but I like my passions. One can be, and one can just stay with them, that's fine. One has to have them long enough to recognize the fact that they produce dukkha. If one hasn't seen their dukkha effect, one will keep them. And maybe one has to do it a little later. The non-burning of Nibbana is the needs the pathway, and the pathway is a noble eight-foot path. The beginning, as right view, has as its next step right intention. And the Buddha said, karma o monks, I declare, is right intention. So right intention has a very lot has a lot to do with karma but it's not only that it has a lot to do with clear comprehension now hopefully you remember that mindfulness sati goes together with sampanyanya with clear comprehension and that the first step to have clear comprehension is to find out what's the purpose of whatever it is I'm thinking, saying, or doing. What's my purpose? And is this purpose getting me any nearer to understanding anicca, dukkha, or anatta? So if we look at the Noble Eightfold Path as a little more than just trying to live on a level where we're not having too many problems, but as the pathway to Nibbana, which it's supposed to be, then we see that intention and purpose are actually the same thing. And the first step of clear comprehension is to investigate our purpose. Now, if we were to do this all the time, if we were to use clear comprehension all the time and investigate our purpose, our means, and our mindfulness and our investigative quality, if we were to do that all the time, we'd never fall off the path. We'd be on it because that would keep us there. We would see quite clearly when we do and think things which are totally off the spiritual path. We could say that if we think negatively, blame others, 
try to distract ourselves have a great deal of wishes and craving and have completely forgotten anicca dukkha anatta we've fallen off the path but if we can remember clear comprehension and its four steps then our very first one where we examine purpose or intention will show us quite clearly what we're on about and as we see what we're on about we will see whether we're helping ourselves or hindering ourselves nobody is going to do a thing for us all the Buddha did was give guidelines he called himself the shore of the way he was absolutely opposed to any idea of guru nobody can do anything for us if we don't do it ourselves nobody will do it it just won't happen and if we have the right intention of wanting to get out of dukkha because that is a right intention then we'll have to use steps to do that and there's nobody that can do it for us because we feel the dukkha ourselves so we have to get out of it by not feeling it anymore there's nothing anyone can do the guidelines are there so intention is also motivation purpose all of that is embedded in checking up on ourselves now this checking up on ourselves in the meditation course we can of course do constantly in daily life it's <coughs> more difficult but the more we have learned it here the easier it will be to take it with us because it becomes habitual the question is again and again is this what I'm thinking saying and doing bringing me nearer to the end of Dukkha or just a momentary relief from it now the momentary relief from Dukkha is Dukkha in itself because it has to be resurrected over and over again so we can see that quite clearly if we investigate right intention means also of course making good karma because we can see where our intentions are the instigators of our thought speech and action and with this kind of self-inquiry that we learn through mindfulness it will be quite apparent to us when we are helping ourselves and when we're hindering ourselves now often when people have difficulties dukkha of any kind they take the way out of distraction in any manner or form that's why television is so popular or even worse distractions which can be um, mind changing all of these things that are just distractions this is a dangerous path to tread unless one is fully enlightened well then one probably wouldn't do it <laughs> because it becomes habitual everything we do can become habit and then it's an addiction and no longer a preference and all addictions are dangerous because they take us off the path a preference is all right because we can live with it or without it but an addiction isn't 
So we have to be very careful how we deal with our dukkha. The best way to deal with it is to recognize its universality. If we are quite clear on the fact that dukkha is, and if we would let go of whatever it is that we want at that moment or don't want at that moment, we wouldn't have it. And we could try that out. And if we see its universality, then we don't have to become unhappy about it. In order to use the Noble Eightfold Path, we have to use every step on it. We can't pick out the ones we like. This is another misconception about the Buddha's teaching. That one can pick out those things which one likes to do, which aren't too difficult, which um, one has read about, or which one um, has heard about, or which one's friends are doing. None of that is useful. Either we use the whole teaching, or we won't have any results. So it's no use picking out bits and pieces out of it. Obviously, we can't practice it all at once, but we can at least know the pathway and recognize the fact that all of it has to be practiced. Now, nobody needs to be perfect in any of that, but everyone who wants to have that path needs to practice it. Perfection is reserved for the Arahant and he is also called a non-practitioner or a non-hearer. We are called Savakas, the hearers. We still have to hear what it's all about. If we don't hear, we won't make it. If we get attached to our dukkha, we might like to be there. People are attached to dukkha. As absurd as it may sound, makes them feel alive. They think that if that's not there, they might not have the ego assertion the ego support system. The following three steps, these are the two steps of the wisdom part, right view and right intention. The following three steps are the steps of the morality. Right speech, right action, right livelihood. Now we have already, at the beginning of this course, had several uh, discourses on morality, particularly about the more refined morality of a spiritual practitioner. Here, in this case, they're very briefly put. And right speech, right action, actually refers to the five precepts without any embellishments which are the minimum moral precepts taken by lay people and four of them are actions and one of them is speech and we have gone through the moral conduct part at quite um, in detail the four action ones no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct and no drugs or alcohol and then abstaining from wrong speech if you remember the right speech 
was detailed in many different ways how one should abstain from certain topics how actually the topic of speech should refer to something that is uplifting within the Dhamma helpful not concerned with worldly conditions because they are with us all the time anyway we don't have to have conversations about them but of course white speech is also if we want to show another person that we care for them when we ask about their health and so forth but the ten topics that were mentioned as the ones that had (coughs) the right speech embedded in them were all concerned with spiritual matters I didn't bring that Speech is a very important aspect in the Buddha's teaching because of the fact that we do a lot of it and have a lot of misunderstandings. And that's why he said that the Dhamma has to be spoken with precision, absolutely clear because the misconceptions are rampant and particularly when it goes from one language to the next he also said that Dhamma should be preached in one's mother tongue one should listen to the Dhamma in one's mother tongue which is quite interesting because when one hears the Dhamma in one's mother tongue it has a different connotation even though one might understand a foreign language and lots of people do it's not the same thing it's a foreign language and because these are foreign concepts anyway at least embedded in the mother tongue they have a little bit of familiarity and they have a feeling behind it because language is not just concept language is more than that it has feeling behind it and because of that in the Buddha's time people were able to become enlightened by listening to just one of his Dhamma discourses because the whole of the enlightenment principle of the Buddha was behind the words So if then a foreign language creeps in, it becomes even more difficult. It's difficult enough in one's mother tongue, isn't it? So these are two uh, things he said in a discourse called the Exposition of Non-Conflict about the teaching or the listening to the Dhamma and he also about lying he said not to exaggerate and not to underrate in the same discourse exaggeration is also lying and underrating is lying in other words it's not necessary to be a huge lie anything which isn't exactly true is a lie it makes it nice and simple if it isn't true it's got to be a lie now of course again with that we have intention behind it but he also said that the end never justifies wrong means so we can remember that also about speech the misconceptions and the mis 
constructions that are put on to language are legion. And when it concerns Dhamma, it's particularly important. Now, although the, um, the speech should be kindly, it should never be flattery. Another thing he said. Flattery is just as detrimental as abuse. Because both are lies. They should always have the welfare of the other person in mind. Now that's a tall order. And we can use it as a guideline. Right livelihood, we also had that at the very beginning, all these strange um, professions that people used to have in the Buddha's time and that we don't have anymore, but we've got plenty of wrong livelihoods now, lots of them. Anything that manufactures or sells or advertises anything that hurts anybody. It's, um, we can check back on our livelihood or on livelihoods in general and see whether there's any hurt to a living being or when, whether it is helpful. We have numerous service jobs which are helping other people. But of course there are also innumerable livelihoods which can be used <coughs> for hurting other people and hurting also animals or hurting the environment. All of that's wrong livelihood. If you remember the Buddha also talked about the um, uh, preservation of the environment. It's quite easy to check on a livelihood. Is it in any violation of the five precepts or is it not? Now the reason for the right kind of livelihood and abstaining from the wrong livelihood is not only making bad karma, which is of course one of the aspects. But some of these things would also support our greed and our hate. And if we support our greed and our hate in our daily activities, it's hardly likely that we're going to get out of it. So we need to watch our whole life and see whether we can put it on a footing where it remains within clear comprehension. Now to check up on our own lives means mindfulness and we put clear comprehension as our guideline. What is the purpose of what we're doing? And justification are manifold, very easy. It's very easy to have a justification for just about anything. In fact, I lived for a, quite a while in a country which was justifying plain murder. It was legal. So we can justify it anything. The mind is a magician. It can justify even murder. And we do that continually, for instance, in war. We justify murder. We don't call it murder. It doesn't sound good. So we need to watch out for our own justifications. Because if our pathway is supposed to be a spiritual life and if our direction is liberation and freedom it's got to be 
all encompassing in our life. We can't use our mind on the meditation pillow in one way and then use it differently during our daily activities. It's got to be one direction. Now the third aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path we have already discussed at great length. That's the part about the concentration. Sama Samadhi. And Sama always means right. And it also has three divisions. Right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. And from those three divisions you can see quite clearly that they follow one another. First comes the effort. Then comes the mindfulness and then comes the concentration, which also answers the often asked question, is concentration and mindfulness the same thing? No, it isn't. It's the seventh and the eighth steps on the Noble Eightfold Path, and they're two totally different words also, in English and also in Pali. But sometimes we can find words which are different and still mean the same thing. Here they certainly don't. One is one step and one Paying, paying attention, being there, knowing, not allowing the mind to play its usual games of either being distracted or being hateful or being or craving or being elated or being depressed or just wandering off into a dream world, not allowing any of that but being right there, being, having the mind like a tool which is sharp and one-pointed and therefore knows. One can also compare mindfulness to examining with an um, examining as if we were in a laboratory where you examine everything very carefully and if you make a mistake you might have an explosion so we examine very carefully and don't get sidetracked but know exactly what's going on And therefore, mindfulness is our greatest support system in daily life for meditation. If we don't practice mindfulness in daily living, then meditation will not succeed. Because again, we only have the one mind, the one mind that out there gets totally distracted goes from one thing to the next and then supposed to be completely one-pointed when it's sitting on the pillow, it just can't do that. It's too much of an expectation. So what we need is a mind which is being kept in check as much as we can remember to do that. Now while we're here, it's not, not so difficult. the four foundations body, feeling, thought, content of thought and in content of thought recognizing the hindrances or the opposites right effort is what leads us to all that And one of the things which is always mentioned under right effort are the four supreme efforts which we have already discussed. And, but right effort needs a balance. Right effort means that we don't go overboard tensing up and wanting badly 
wanting to be concentrated, wanting to be enlightened, wanting to have the spiritual path, whatever we want. That doesn't work. There has to be a balancing effect. A balancing effect which balances between letting oneself go completely and flaking out totally and tightening up so tight that one can't even get the body to relax. The answer to that is self-surrender. Because if self is surrendered, nobody's flaking out and nobody's tensing up. So the determination for self-surrender is one of the best starting points for meditation. Right effort is something that has to be renewed. And especially when one is at home, here it's not so difficult because here we have the group energy to help us. And we've got some bells going also, which is very helpful. At home, nobody rings bells, and most people don't have a group at home either. So right effort is strictly our own uh, responsibility. And there, it's very helpful not to think when one comes home from a course such as this, I'm now going to meditate for the rest of my life too long it's much better to think I'm going to meditate tomorrow morning before going to bed and when one wakes up I'm going to meditate this morning now that's all because the other is first of all it's too long but it's also much too diffuse it's not real but tomorrow morning that's real And when one actually has tomorrow morning, then saying, now, that's helpful. That's right effort. That applies to all our efforts. Now. If you remember, it's said in the book, procrastination is a thief of time. So right effort means doing it now. And doing it now means also that we become more and more aware of each moment. If you remember, anicca dukkha has to be seen in each moment in order to have the impact of complete flowing and uh, flowing away and dissolution of this person which seems so compact. Only then, when it's a moment-to-moment awareness, do we have that feeling. So effort is now, mindfulness is now, and certainly concentration can only be now. It's impossible to watch the breath which is already gone. It's also impossible to watch the breath which is yet to come. It's only possible to watch the breath which I'm breathing now. It's only possible to watch the sensations which we have now. It can never be in the future. It can never be in the past. That's all finished. But it can be again and again if we're here now. Right concentration, samal samadhi, always means the jhanas. It can't mean anything else because that's the only full concentration there is. Everything else has other names. Momentary concentration, neighborhood concentration. The first one is actually called uh, working concentration. We're still working on it. So... Samasamadhi, the eighth step on the Noble Eightfold Path, right concentration, the eight jhanas. And if we can now look at the Noble Eightfold Path as if it were a circle and not a ladder, but a circle, a circle, a circular pathway which has eight lanes, And having gone along on that and having come to 
Sama Samadhi. Then Samaditi, right view, is so much easier. In fact, some of the right view is automatic. It can't not happen because one's experiencing it. Now if we <coughs> work on right view, that is good too. But the real impact comes when the mind is concentrated, has been concentrated without any obstructions, without anything that is bothering it at all, and seeing things new. Because that's our problem with wrong view. We've been seeing things in the same way over and over again and we can't get out of the rut. And everybody else is seeing them in that way and they're in the same rut. And because everybody's in the same rut, we think they must be right. Quantity does not mean quality. So, when our mind has, however, the ability to gain access to different levels of consciousness, it has also the ability to gain access to different ways of viewing the same thing. Insight, a really deep insight, usually has the, the connotation of seeing something that one has known, read, heard about, thought about a long time and then seeing it in its simplicity, in its utter and complete simplicity. Sure, everybody knows everything is impermanent, but seeing the simplicity of this impermanence in every thought moment and living with that and feeling it it's all the difference. Knowing it gives rise to proliferation in the mind. Saying, oh yes, everything is impermanent. Yes, that means, and then one has a long story of what that all means. It means nothing. It just means that everything that comes goes constantly. The simplicity of it all is the main aspect of insight. What else could it mean? That everything that comes goes constantly, that's all. And that one's got to feel it. And as one feels it, then the mind says, of course. And then one realizes that one's made much too much of a difficult uh, philosophy out of it. All the insights that we have been talking about on this pathway can also be referred back to the Noble Eightfold Path. They can, they're all embedded in the 37 factors of enlightenment, which I have now mentioned all of them. And there are some repetitions in it, so it's not so difficult to mention all of them. And the third of the Four Noble Truths is what we're going to discuss in some manner or form as we go along on the inside path, which will be tomorrow and the next day. So that's enough for this evening. Any questions? This is the time to ask them. Yes. You said that uh, when we experience different levels of consciousness, we can then experience different levels of insight. Or, or maybe I said right view. It would mean the same thing. Okay. <coughs> yes. Um, you said that uh, that uh, we experience. Uh, 
desire to be, you said desire and the opposite of desire. Craving to be and craving not to be. I'm sure. <laughs> I associated the opposite of desire as to be aversion. But yeah, it's the same thing. That if you have sure, sure, if you have craving not to be, you have aversion to being. Okay. It's certainly. I, I think you used that when you were describing the second noble truth, right? and you said it's also desire and its opposite. Yes. So that does mean Yes, but it's usually expressed in the translations as craving to be and craving not to be. But it's the craving not to be means aversion to being. So it's perfectly all right to say like that also. It's quite right. Yes. You said something about investigating this uh, craving to be the fear, that all fear is related to that. Could you say some more about that? Uh, yes, all right. Right. Um, you mean when a fear actually arises? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, the first thing that when the fear actually arises would be to question it, what am I afraid of? And then you might get an answer which says, uh, oh, I'm afraid that this person won't like me. Hmm? Okay. Well, then the next question is, well, why should I be afraid of that, that that person doesn't like me? Then maybe your answer will be, but I want everybody to like me. And then you can ans- ask yourself, well, is that a possibility? And ho- hopefully you say, no, it's not a possibility. <laughs> so you've come to already to the absurdity of that, of that fear. Um, but if you go further, you can also say, well... I want everybody to like me. Why? Why do I want everybody to like me? Well, the answer to that would be, if you see it properly, is because that means that I'm okay. Right? Why do I have to be told I'm okay by other people? Next question. Because I myself can't tell it, okay? But if you want to go further on that, you'll also say, well, do I really have to find out that I'm okay? What does that mean? It's a support system, okay. Do I need this support system? What am I trying to support? The bottom line is always ego. Always. But you've got to get there yourself. It's no use looking at the fear and saying, yes, I know the bottom line is ego, and then go on, because that doesn't help. You have to see the whole gamut until you get to the bottom line. And then you say, aha, ego. Hmm. Yes, well, I'm, I'm looking for a support system for the ego. It's very clear in all fears. All fears are very useful for that. I mean, they're not something, they're not a no-no. They are a very useful investigation procedure. But only if one does it that way, if one uses every answer for a new question. And if they don't, if you don't, I mean, if it arises, that's great. Um... If, it, if you haven't got it, if it doesn't arise, then check out whether there is craving to be, which the opposite is also to watch the, the uh, personal death. If there's any resistance to personal death, which is not a craving not to be, but because death is a, is a sure <coughs> thing, it's a certainty, then you can see that there is craving to be. If the, if the death is not something which is it's okay today, it's okay this evening, then there's craving to be. So you can then find out what am I afraid of. Even if you hadn't had the fear arise, you can use that as a trigger. Use that, I mean, the feeling of, I don't want to die tonight. You know? oh, but why not? Why not? What have, I got, what have I left undone? So why can't I do it quickly? Yeah, that that kind of thing. All of that is is all bound up, completely embedded in craving to be bhava tanha, which is which is the the uh, reason um, this craving to be is the 
effect, not the reason, it's the effect of our ego illusion. I mean, if we didn't have the ego illusion, we couldn't be afraid of anything. Because who would be afraid? Then it's like an insight investigation. Or Very important one. Very important one. And please put your attention on the breath for just a few moments. Think of the most beautiful statue or painting of the Buddha that you've ever seen. One that you feel really happy about. And then let that beautiful likeness of the Buddha enter into your heart and make it at home there then become aware of this beautiful likeness of the Buddha in your heart being full of love and compassion so that there's no room for anything else in your heart See the rays of love and compassion emanating from that beautiful Buddha in your heart. And these rays are filling you and surrounding you. put your attention on the person sitting nearest you in this room and let the rays of love and compassion emanating from the Buddha in your heart reach out to that person and fill him or her and surround him or her with these beautiful rays that love and compassion will reach out to that person
Now let the rays of love and compassion emanating from the beautiful Buddha in your heart reach out to everyone here. Fill and surround everyone with the warmth of love and the care of compassion. Now think of your parents, whether they're still alive or not, and let the rays of love and compassion from the beautiful Buddha in your heart reach out to them, filling and surrounding them. Giving them the gift of your heart. Think of those people who are nearest and dearest to you. And let the rays of love and compassion from the beautiful Buddha in your heart fill and surround them without any wish to have the same coming back to you. Think of all your friends who are also practicing on the Buddha's path and see the same beautiful Buddha in their hearts emanating rays of love and compassion 
and let these rays all join together loving each other Think of all those people who are part of your life. Acquaintances, relations, neighbors. Anyone who comes into your life. And let the rays of love and compassion from the beautiful Buddha in your heart reach out to each one of those. Let them feel the gift of your heart. Think of anyone whom you find difficult or towards whom you feel indifferent and recognize the fact that the Buddha's love and compassion goes everywhere. So let those rays emanating from your heart reach out to that person too. No difference from everyone else. And now let the rays of love and compassion from the beautiful Buddha in your heart go as far as they will reach to people and beings near and far. Those present in this place, those present in the houses in the area around here, And then going further and further, as far as the emanation coming from the beautiful Buddha in your heart will go, bringing love and compassion to whoever can receive it. Giving your heart, giving your love. for no reason except that that is the function of the heart.
now think of any special person that you would particularly want to give love and compassion to or who could particularly benefit from it and let those rays emanating from the beautiful Buddha in your heart reach out to that person Now put your attention back on yourself. And be happy having this beautiful Buddha in your heart, emanating rays of love and compassion. Feel the joy that comes from that. Feel the warmth. and the well-being resulting feel them from head to toe And now anchor the beautiful Buddha in your heart so that it may become one with it. May our beings have love and compassion in their hearts.